Okay, thank you very much for the introduction and thank you for inviting me to talk today. I'm really uh, inspired by two groups of people who uh, helped me to design and to write this talk. The first one is prescribers, uh, physicians who are enrolled into um, genomics education program and we teach pharmacogenomics to them. And the second group is uh, patient public involvement groups uh, through the funding from the National Institute of Health Research for applied research in health uh, um, um, in health health inequalities. So um, the first thing is. <coughs> Genomics education program is designed to uh, to um, for people from the NHS who we hope that are going to be prescribers of all the uh, pharmacogenomic uh, knowledge that we've got into the NHS and it's a master's program, masters in genomics, which is fully funded by the NHS and uh, uh, it is. Uh, open to all healthcare uh, scientists, medical profession, nurses, midwifery, pharmacists, and so on. And if you can see here on this table, the largest number of people who enroll into this are actually medics. And I must say that it's a privilege to interact with them and to, uh, to answer all their questions and skepticisms about pharmacogenomics and uh, uh, our knowledge of pharmacogenomics and whether it's helpful in clinical practice. So I would like to talk about the level of evidence that is needed to warrant implementation into clinical practice. Interpretation of the data relate, related to drug response and also of, uh, about the uptake of genetic testing by healthcare professionals and patients. And uh, um, I'm focusing on germline mutations in, of clinical significance. And if you look at the number of drugs that have uh, approved, uh, uh, approved drugs that contain pharmacogenomic information in them, about 160, 30 of those are used to treat cancer, and only about 8 of them uh, have reference to germline mutations of clinical relevance. And this is the table which shows um, some of these drugs and uh, 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 gene uh, pairs. And I will talk about uh, most of them. So the challenges with germline mutations are the same as for any other uh, uh, area of pharmacogenomics. So we, we need to prove clinical validity, whether these uh, uh, tests could predict the outcome, and also we need to look into clinical utility uh, to see whether uh, tests significantly improve patient outcome. We are also challenged with rapid development of marketing of different tests, and these are some of the challenges, and particularly the biggest challenge is the robust re regulatory infrastructure for genetic testing. So we've seen this before, uh, that a large survey of 10,000 physicians show that actually they do acknowledge that there is a need for uh, knowledge in pharmacogenomics, but only about 10% felt that they are adequately informed about it. And what is interesting is that early adopters are more likely to be practicing uh, oncology. So, interpretation of uh, all the tests uh, in relation to germline uh, pharmacogenomics is twofold. The first uh, hurdle is to uh, to enable and to, to uh, really help uh, physicians to interpret published research results. And the second, um, the second step is how to uh, practically interpret results that they get from laboratories. 
So um, we've seen today that uh, consistency in guidelines for targeted drugs is uh, quite good. So somatic mutations, given the design of drugs, was based on uh, some tests. But complexity of interpretation of uh, germline pharmacogenomic markers is much larger. And there are some examples which we use always when we talk about pharmacogenomics. And uh, as I said, I do teach pharmacogenomics at um, master's level and, and also undergraduate level. And we use some examples such as uh, uh, thiopurin and, and TPMT pharmacogenetics as excellent examples of how pharmacogenomics can help. And uh, we know that um, thiopurins could be used to manage inflammatory bowel disease, uh, rheumatological disease, and all, of course uh, um, cancers such as uh, uh, leukemias in children, ALL leukemias. Uh, they are effective in about 50 to 75 percent of patients. And uh, there are approximately 40 to 60,000 prescriptions in the UK uh, per year. So this is an old drug, uh, first prescribed in 1962. And our knowledge about uh, 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 thiopurine drugs is, is huge. We are particularly interested in some side effects and bone marrow suppression has been associated with uh, genetic factors. And if we look at uh, thiopurine metabolism, uh, we can see that uh, azathioprine, 6 uh, mercaptopurin and uh, uh, thioguanin are all uh, uh, metabolized into the same uh, thioguanin nucleotide major active metabolite. And excess in this metabolite is associated with increased risk of bone marrow suppression. So I deliberately selected this um, uh, um, picture because it's nearly 30 years old. So our knowledge about pharmacogenomics of TPMTs is, as I said, huge and also long uh, lasting, and we use this as a, as a good example. And we know that 90% of individuals have normal activity of TPMT, 10% of individuals have intermediate and activity, and they have an increased risk of bone marrow suppression. And approximately 0.3% uh, have very low or absent activity, uh, and so they have very highly increased risk of bone marrow suppression. And uh, uh, what is also shown here is TPMT activity, uh, trimodal distribution of um, uh, activity of the enzyme. When we look at some of the uh, pathways in farm GKB, we can see that this is far more complex than what we are describing. However, we reduce the information to uh, uh, only uh, one factor or few factors and disregard the rest of, of all this complicated pathway. And um, so early onset neutropenia is associated with uh, reduced or absent thiopurine metal transferase. So the message is very clear, simple, and easy to uh, understand for people who are not working in pharmacogenomics. Recently, there were several publications about other loci which are also important uh, in adverse drug reactions. And one of them is NUT-T15, which um, in the first study published in Nature Genetics was shown to have a much higher uh, sensitivity and specificity than TPMT in patients in Korea. And it was thought that that may have been uh, related to ethnicity. However, a recent report has shown that in children with uh, uh, acute lymphoblastic leukemia from diverse ethnicities, this gene seems to be uh, 
important in, in their uh, intolerance of uh, thiopurine. And what we can see here is the gene <coughs> of interest and also its protein with three uh, um, uh, SNPs that have been found to, to have an effect. These are rare variants with very highly uh, damaging effects. Now, apart from our knowledge about the science and mechanism of, of toxicity of TPMT uh, substrates, we also have a lot of evidence that testing for TPMT in clinical practice is cost effective. And I just showed two studies here that <coughs> um, have been published long time ago and uh, which show that, that uh, actually testing is um, uh, uh, cost effective because you can actually do many, many tests uh, to if you prevent one toxicity in a patient. So I know, and <clears throat> I'm sure that I don't have to convince you that uh, TPMT pharmacogenetics is um, important, and it has, we have peer-reviewed evidence that testing is clinically useful and cost-effective. However, when we look at <clears throat> uh, recommendations which have been published from FDA, uh, EMA or Canadian uh, regulatory agency, they differ. And while FDA say that testing is recommended, EMA and Canadian agency actually say that it's actionable. And I put here the difference between these two recommendations. Recommended states that we uh, recommend and imply that some sort of either gene, protein, or chromosomal testing will be done. However, actionable pharmacogenomics means that it does not require any testing or protein and chromosomal, um, any testing. So this is for the <coughs> drug which is actually a poster child of pharmacogenomics. And there is a difference in recommendations uh, how to, to uh, treat these patients. And I looked further into a uh, um, recently published paper, actually last, last week published paper, about evaluation of prescriber responses to pharmacogenomics uh, and their clinical decision support system for TPMT testing. Uh, the study was done at Mayo Clinic and they assessed responses <clears throat> to pharmacogenomic-based clinical decision support alert designed to prompt um, testing for uh, uh, status before prescribing uh, TPMT substrates. It was a single center uh, retrospective study and they evaluated prescriber compliance with the pretest and uh, uh, they provided also a pop-up link which could, be, um, which could lead to educational resources so that they could guide dosing. And the results are, out of 500 um, alerts, they generated only 20% response, uh, and either phenotypic or genotypic was ordered, and among those patients that were uh, tested, 70% had uh, normal TPMT activity, while 29 had intermediate uh, genotypes. And out of all of these, only three patients were prescribed guidelines supporting doses uh, after uh, clinical decision support system alerts. So what they concluded is that there is a low use of online TPMT uh, dosing resources and that 
perhaps the alerting accuracy was not good, or maybe uh, clinicians and, and pharmacists have a alert fatigue because they've got so many pop-up uh, things uh, that they actually start to ignore them. And this is one of the uh, feedbacks that we've got from uh, GP practices and from GPs that uh, they actually do not want any more uh, pop-ups and, and any more alerts. So the same group published um, a paper in uh, how some of the technical challenges and opportunities uh, for implementing pharmacogenomics decision uh, integrated into electronic he health records. And um, what they suggested is some of the discussions that we had yesterday is that uh, there is a multidisciplinary team approach needed, uh, structured format of test results, so that the results are short and, and uh, discreet. Um, and also they uh, advised not to use all of these uh, pop-up alerts which um, are, as I said, ignored. So moving on to some other drugs which, for which evidence is controversial. So there is a, a recent uh, um, CPIC guidelines for tamoxifen uh, uh, therapy. Tamoxifen <coughs> is used in uh, uh, patients with uh, uh, estrogen positive uh, breast cancers and um, uh, approximately 70% uh, of breast cancer patients respond to tamoxifen therapy. Metabolism uh, uh, important metabolism is by cytochrome P452D6, which uh, is involved in formation of endoxifen and 4-hydroxytamoxifen, which have metabolites that have approximately 100-fold uh, more potent antriestogenic effect. There are many conflicting results in the literature, and... Um, uh, as I said, only recently, uh, CPIC issued uh, recommendations. Um, I know that this is too small to read <coughs> recommendations, but uh, what is important is that ultra-rapid metabolizers and normal metabolizers uh, should um, uh, continue with endoxifen and be careful about not having uh, any... Uh, induces or inhibitors of uh, CYP2D6 and then the rest of uh, the patients should be considering uh, alter alternative treatment with um, 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 some, some other uh, drugs. So what is also important to, to mention that CYP2D6 is not the only um, gene that is important for clinical decisions uh, about um, uh, prescribing and treatment of cancer. So, um, in terms of efficacy, um, estrogen and progesterone receptors are important, and also in terms of toxicity, uh, there are reports that uh, uh, prothrombin or factor V Leiden should be taken into consideration uh, uh, to prevent um, uh, thrombosis. Another drug uh, classes, um, and certainly uh, 5 fluorouracil um, has um, been used a lot, and uh, um, it's catabolized uh, via dehydro. Uh, pyrimidine dehydro dehydrogenase and deficiency of DPYD <coughs> can lead to um, a serious and fatal, potentially fatal toxicity. Um, so, update of the clinical um, implementation consortium guidelines on dehydropyrimidine dehydrogenase. Um, has been issued recently 
and uh, it has, in terms of classification of recommendations, these are uh, strong recommendations and clear uh, indication of how to treat these patients. Uh, there is also, there are many papers that show that uh, uh, cost effectiveness of this testing is um, uh, positive and that uh, um, that it should be used in, and there is no reason why it shouldn't be used in clinical practice. Irinotecan is another drug that is used for treatment of colorectal cancer, and uh, its uh, uh, active metabolite is SN38, uh, which is important uh, for both efficacy and toxicity of the drug. And um, variation in the promoter of that drug, um, uh, in uh, promoter of um, uh, glucuronidation uh, of that drug, leads to uh, toxicity uh, with irinotecan. So the first phase of um, um, metabolism is uh, carboxyl esterases, and uh, and then UGT. Uh, glucuronidation phase 2 metabolism. So if this phase 2 metabolism is slowed down, the uh, increase of uh, toxic metabolite uh, occurs and uh, toxicity. So toxicity includes severe diarrhea and neutropenia. So irinotecan pathway uh, has been again, well uh, described, and uh, we know the mechanism of toxicity, and also there are clear guidelines on uh, uh, its toxicity and how it should be used. So I would like to um, say a few words now about BRCA testing for ovarian cancer and uh, PARP inhibitors. So, 2% of all cancers are ovarian cancers, and uh, it's been estimated that uh, lifetime risk for ovarian cancer is about 1%. So, women um, with, who, who are diagnosed with ovarian cancer, 40% uh, of these women have a, a mutation in BRCA1 or BRCA2 gene, and in Italian, Jewish, and uh, um, Asian women, this uh, frequency is much higher. Uh, what is also interesting is that uh, um, only about um, 44 or 44% uh, of mutation carriers do not report any family history of breast or ovarian cancer. And we can see here from uh, uh, papers that uh, the five-year survival could be increased with these uh, mutations. So BRCA1 and 2 are tumor uh, suppression genes, and um, uh, loss of function of these genes uh, leads to uh, genomic instability and uh, faulty repair of uh, um, DNA. So how the testing is um, done. So turnaround time is about 40 days and cost is about 500 pounds. And there are several potential results either to find mutation, variants of unknown significance or uninformative results. And Recently, NICE guidelines were um, updated to uh, say that testing should be done to all uh, women with 10% chance of having a BRCA mutation, or it should be considered for all women uh, who have um, a chance, 8% chance of having BRCA tested. And, um, very often, uh, pharmacogenomics and personalized medicine is thought to be uh, f uh, a medicine for privileged few rather than for the whole population. 
And what we have done is we looked at uh, uptake of diagnostic BRCA testing in the Northwest uh, in uh, regarding the deprivation quantile. And what we can see here is that uh, the least deprived, actually, uh, least deprived women <coughs> have slower uptake of BRCA testing than most deprived. And when we looked at, um, at this, uh, depending on the um, new guidelines, nice guidelines, so what we can see that in the past, uh, least deprived or most deprived women were the ones that uh, <coughs> uh, before uh, most deprived women were uh, up, uptake was lower in, in most deprived women. However, with uh, new guidelines, it seems that uh, um, this is reversing. So, how do we um, <clears throat> how do we then inform women and family about their risk? So we know that BRCA1 carriers. Uh, have about 70% chance uh, to develop breast cancer, about 50% ovarian cancer, and also have an increased risk of second primary cancers. For BRCA2, cancer risks are a bit lower in women, but what is also very interesting is that uh, prostate cancer and male breast cancer um, patients have higher um, um, risk. And PARP inhibitors, Olaparib, have been introduced um, recently in 2016 for women uh, with BRCA mutation who are platinum sensitive. Mechanisms of action of PARP inhibitors is uh, through um, um, repair, uh, uh, gene repair uh, system. So in normal cell, uh, both base excision repair and homologous uh, recombination repair work well. If there is a BRCA mutation uh, which affects homologous recombination repair, uh, DNA repair will uh, occur and viable cells will occur anyway. If PARP deficiency or inhibitor of uh, PARP uh, gene is uh, given, then again, viable cell will result. But if both, if a combination of BRCA mutation and PARP inhibition uh, would lead to uh, cell death. And this mechanism of action um, has been um, uh, shown in uh, different studies. So what are the benefits of testing for, for BRCA. So we've got clinical intervention uh, with a, a drug. There is a potential for better prognosis of patients who are carriers of, of BRCA genes. And uh, they could also access clinical trials. They could do some screening or risk reducing strategies. And we, we know that um, some of the drastic um, uh, uh, strategies of reducing risk were um, very much in the media with uh, uh, Angelina Jolie um, gene and bilateral mastectomy. Uh, they can also um, uh, so these are all the benefits of BRCA mutation testing. But there are also some uh, risks and these are mainly psychological distress and also informing the whole family. And there was a study in Australia where they looked at uh, um, how this dissemination of BRCA results from patients but also to their families was communicated and what are the barriers to that. They looked at uh, um, nearly 700 carriers of of um, uh, risk alleles or risk genes 
and uh, um, 165 families uh, participated in this study. Uh, they were the success of dissemination of this information was in about 80% of relatives. But what was also shown that in all uh, families, uh, sorry, in, in about half of the families, at least one relative wasn't uh, informed. And these partially informed families uh, exhibited much higher uh, level of stress and uh, anxiety uh, about um, not reporting this risk. So what I wanted to, to show uh, today is that germline genetic testing is important and that uh, it's important for the patient but also for the rest of the families and that there are new uh, recommendations on standardized gene tests. What is needed is succinct and concordant guidelines that are detailed enough uh, but which enable interpretation for um, uh, non-specialists in the field. So, thank you.